Report. Okay, we are it to go. Hey, everybody, uh, thanks for hanging in there. We had some technical difficulties, which let's face it is obligatory. You can never take any technology for granted. Uh, we hung in there and we're ready to roll. So um, welcome back to the 1455 author series. Uh, I'm Sean Murphy, I'm the executive director of 1455. If this is your first time checking us out, uh, thank you for doing so and thank you for uh, hanging in there for the short delay. If this is your first time, what do we do and who are we? 1455 is a nonprofit and we celebrate storytelling and anyone who tells stories. Uh, we have uh, a, a variety of free programming including our monthly author series. We have a bi-monthly magazine. The next issue drops on Monday, by the way. Um, if you want to find out more and support us, you can check us out at 1455litarts.org. And before I introduce tonight's special guest, Lisa Rosenberg, I'm also happy, as always, to be partnering with Washington, D.C.'s Historic Potter's House, which is a bookshop, cafe, nonprofit event space in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, DC. Since 1960, they've been a key place for deeper conversation, creative expression, and community transformation. We had a live event there last month. We'll have more live events there in the new year. I encourage you to check them out, support them. And when you buy tonight's book, a copy or three, and all of your book needs, consider shopping at Potter's House and supporting independent bookstores. Okay, without further ado, let me welcome tonight's author, Lisa Williamsburg, Williamson <laughs> Rosenberg, excuse me, is a writer, former ballet dancer, and psychotherapist, specializing in depression, complex trauma, and racial identity. Her essays have appeared in Long Reads, Narratively, Mama Load, and The Defenders Online, as well as The Common. Her fiction has been published in the Piltdown Review and Literary Mama, where Lisa received a push, push cart nomination. A born and raised New Yorker and mother of two college students, Lisa now lives in Montclair, New Jersey with her husband and dog. Lisa, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. John, thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to, to be here. Well, uh, <laughs> the, the honor is mine. And I want to start by congratulating you, Embers on the One Out. Congratulations for writing a beautiful book. And um, the what has been the obvious and positive response that it's received, um, looking at Amazon, for instance, there are a ton of reviews, and that's always a, a great sign of engagement. Um, talk a little bit, if you'd like, to set the tone for how Embers on the Wind has been resonating with people. Um, so I've been getting a lot of feedback that, that I kind of, you know, expected people said, you know, this is such a powerful story about a house and, you know, a house with history that, that kind of resonates um, for the present as well as the past. It, it's the story essentially of an underground railroad safe house sort of turned 21st century Airbnb and they're sort of different incarnations of it. It was a place where someone raised their children during the 1980s and they did tours for college students in the 90s and um, the, their sort of spirits uh, inhabiting the house from back when it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So people have been talking to me about how it resonated in terms of um, racial and ethnic identity and kind of class privilege because some of the the black women who come to the house you know the in the 21st century are now affluent educated upper class and still you know kind of grappling with the legacy of slavery and sort of it, it kind of puts privilege in there into the story in a way that a lot of people said to me wow i never thought about privilege, class privilege, racial privilege, white privilege this way before, um, which surprised, it surprised me. And yet I kind of was going for that because the, the notion of, um, the notion of, of having a certain kind of affluence and financial and economic comfort doesn't, um, doesn't save you from racism. And, and so in, in very subtle ways, and, and it kind of gets into the book, even though that's not 
the bulk of the story. The bulk of the story is sort of a trying to find connection to oneself, kind of for everyone in the book, black and white, past and present. Um, but what really did surprise me were, were people who wrote in their reviews, this book is so scary. Don't read this book alone. Don't read it at <laughs> night. And I was like, wow, I hadn't thought of it. that. Although, you know, there are ghosts in this book. And the, some of the ghosts aren't so benign, you know, or, or I know them, you know, for example, Bertie is a child ghost and she does some pretty frightening things. Although I think of her as the whole little girl, like a little girl who is trying to protect a friend. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I didn't see it. And I think that's true of a lot of authors who don't set out to write a thriller, but do your characters have to be three-dimensional you don't necessarily say I'm going to write someone who's going to really scare you right. but you know that was interesting to me well and I think one of the and we'll get into we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts but one of the things I think it was really neat and, and to me kind of a novel concept of, of sorts that it's not just one person say that's that's impacted by these spirits a lot mm -hmm. of the characters can either see or interact and and that really brings both the reader and all these characters who now have something mm -hmm. at stake. So, so there's this tension running of, it isn't just one person telling their story and this kind mm -hmm. of, you know, the supernatural uh, interaction. There's a lot of people, uh, the house right. itself mm -hmm. is pulling these people in and, and kind of right. making them part of the story. And the, the way I, I told the story, you know, on one hand, it could have been one, arc or one a, a thought of going back and forth from the ghost of Clementine who was who ran away from a plantation in nine in 1850 and Galen who's a young psychologist and a new mom with postpartum depression in 2018 and you know I could have had them you know have a whole book going back and forth between the two of them but instead I wanted different aspects of it and so it comes out in very closely linked stories. And that's kind of why there are so many characters. And I think some people were, were reading it thinking, well, is so-and-so going to come back? When am I going to find out what happens? And each story is sort of contained, even though it links to the others. And it all ties into the house. Um, and I'm, I don't want to give spoilers, but it, yeah. um, you know, I think it, the, the perspective of little Annie, who is the first person to speak in the book and the last person to speak in the book. Mm -hmm. And she is also the spirit of, of an escaped freedom seeker, of, an, of a formerly enslaved woman who sets off to find her, to find what could be, who could be left of her six boys who were sold away from her one by one. Um, so, yeah. Well, so you know, more questions I, I, you. yeah, I've got it. I've got a ton of questions, but I always find you know the best mm -hmm. way to to really introduce a book or or for people that have already read it, like myself, mm -hmm. it's always a treat to hear the author read. I would love if you're willing to to read a short section um, and give us all a taste of of, the, of this rich narrative. Mm -hmm. So I was going back and forth so much today about what to read because on readings, I often do the beginning. And I think, you know, I don't want to do the beginning always because I, I want to mix it up for myself. Yeah. Um, I decided to, you know, but now that I'm talking about the house and I'm talking about Annie, I think I am on second thought going to start with the beginning and I'm going to start with Whitaker House, which is sort of looming and it begins with a seance and and Dominique who is trying to she's come from Canada and she is trying to find someone who knew an ancestor of hers who was sort of a myth growing as she was growing up and she's discovered that he was real um and she's come down south to Massachusetts uh, so I will put on my reading glasses do you want me to do it now yeah absolutely yeah okay please. so here we go I'm going to read okay. now the very beginning of the book and the first chapter is called Midnight. And these glasses really don't make a difference. <laughs> my, these are my husband's reading glasses, but I'm, you know what, I'm gonna do my best. Yeah, they're a little. Okay, <clears throat> Midnight, Little Annie, Whitaker House, Monterey, Massachusetts, October, 2019. 
It's like being awakened from a dream, a real feeling dream where you didn't know you were sleeping, like being pulled from a thick, muddy river bottom into cold, clean water. Though last I checked, rivers don't have candles and this place is full of them. Voices murmur around me, a prayer I've never heard. I can't see any people at first, just feel heat from their bodies and breath. Something in me quickens and I get a notion that one of my children is nearby like God opened the world just a crack to show me my boy. Lewis, baby, are you here? I do know this place. The first time I came, my companion was a pregnant girl by the name of Clementine. When the patty rollers came, I got free but had to leave her behind. I can feel her here too, my sweet friend and the child she called Bertie. Now the candlelights dance, showing me parts of people, a sleeve, a shoulder, hands and fingers intertwined all around the table. But where am I? Where is my body? The mangled hands I'm known by. These massive fingers are not my own, which this, sorry, this massive figure is not my own, which was light and compact, no bigger than a young boy. I look down to see heavy white hands holding the brown ones on either side of me, thick white fingers, five on each hand, making a full 10, which proves my hunch. From Craven County all the way to Wilkes, anyone who ever heard of little Annie Durham knew I hadn't but eight. Dominique. In the glimmering light, shadows dance and faces become glowing masks of themselves, each participant hoping for the miracle of a reunion. Lady Leanna, holding hands with two of the seekers who took their seats early, lifts her chin beginning to rock. Dominique is just as determined to make contact as the rest of the group members, but the mindset eludes her as she checks on her little boy who's sitting on the floor in the corner playing on his iPad. If she had childcare, Dominique would have been here in time to secure the spot she's entitled to by Lady Leanna's side. The Seekers, named after their freedom-seeking ancestors, wouldn't even be here at Winterker House if not for Dominique. It was she who found the aged Sears business card on the bulletin board at the Red Lion Inn in Stockbridge. Lady Leanna, mistress of the occult, hurling font full of promise and potency. From a Google search, Dominique learned that Lady Leanna's real name is Leanne Whitaker of the Tyringham Monterey Whitakers, the abolitionist family who built this house 225 years ago, one of many Underground Railroad safe houses in Berkshire County. Some fugitives got no further than this house, perishing within these very walls or elsewhere on the grounds. Lady Leanna has led a few seances for, seances for the seekers before this, but tonight, is the first time she invited them to Whitaker House. And Dominique has a feeling in her gut that this is the place where he passed through, the ancestors of Grandmere's stories. She sensed it, can I keep going? I don't know if I'm up to my time. You're okay, fine. I got a little more time because I wanted to, there's a Take place. Where I wanted to. Okay, she sensed it the moment she stepped out of the car, gazing up at the sprawling farmhouse whose chipped red paint looked incandescent in the moonlight, her pulse quickened. Dominique awoke. Sydney, which wasn't easy, then pulled the drowsy child up the gravel walk. <laughs> Lady Leanna stood in the doorway, disapproving. You've brought your baby again. Sydney is three, not a baby. Under normal circumstances, he would have corrected the mischaracterization, but Lady Leanna's grand proportions, pallor, severe gaze, and towering silver white hair intimidated him. There was no one to watch him, Dominique explained, but he'll be good, I promise. When Lady Leanna ushered them inside, Dominique could smell the package fresh autumnal potpourri mingling with old wood as if someone had taken pains to cover up the odor of something sinister. All these old safe houses have stories to tell, some less savory than others. The floorboards creaked, echoing the deep metallic ticking of a grandfather clock whose face lit up as Lady Leanna's candle sailed by. Sydney squeezed Dominique's hand, but didn't complain about the scary darkness as another child might. He's used to being dragged along to observing these meetings in murky alcoves, the candles, the grown-ups' excited whispers, the chants aimed at reaching the dead. While the group members took turns kissing ladies, Lady Leanna's hand, Dominique imagined how this would look to Michelle, her non-believing ex-girlfriend. 
eight young black people groveling before an old white lady dressed in beads and lace. But Lady Liana says, touching a seer with your lips as well as your fingers quickens communication with the spirits. Besides, Michelle is not here. Sydney is fine now, calm with his iPad. He's so good. Dominique glances at him once more in the middle of the initial incantation and sees he's not alone. A little girl about his age with fluffy coils of hair is sitting beside him, delicate chin on his shoulder, eyes appearing to take in the images on his device just as natural as can be. Sydney either doesn't notice or doesn't mind the company. I should worry, Dominique thinks, since she doesn't know who the other child is or where she came from. But a worrying sort of mother wouldn't bring Sydney to a midnight seance at all. Dominique exhales and adds her voice to the last lines of the chant as Lady Liana shudders, rocking more violently. The whites of the old woman's eyes shine in the, in the candlelight. The deep and scratchy voice that comes from her throat is not her own. Yay. Wow. Well, Lee, thank you for that, Lisa. And I'll say, I, you know, I, I think with any novel, really, there's no wrong answer about what excerpt to read, but I'm glad you you read from the beginning because I think one of the things I wanted to congratulate you on is I, I you know this is a this is a book um, that that the reader has to meet on the author's terms you know it's not an easy um, you know it's not an easy narrative that hand feeds um, the you know the, the the plot and the characters and I think that's a sign of extreme confidence and successful execution that it's so compelling from the get go the reader almost kind of lets go of the guardrail and says, all right, I'm in a different world or I'm in a bunch of different worlds and I'm going along for the ride. Um, so congratulations for pulling that off. But you mentioned earlier how you, you had initially thought about, you know, keeping the narrative more constrained in terms of characters and points of view, but you decided to throw it all in. Talk a little bit about the evolution of, of how you arrived at just going for broke really in terms of, throwing it all in there. And again, in a way it was very effective. Mm -hmm. so, I will say that, that the book started with the house and it started with the ghost. And I don't know if I had uh, mentioned it here, but the, the house, Whitaker House is based on my father-in-law's summer home. And it was indeed a, a Berkshire County, it's in Monterey, Massachusetts, stop on the Underground Railroad and um, escaped formerly enslaved African-Americans would hide in, not in the house itself, but on the property in the root cellar. And um, the root cellar is still there. It's kind of in, like I described in the book, it's in the grass in a hillock and there's kind of a door, a wooden door in the, in the grass. And that's why it was hidden. Uh, apparently, um, a female freedom seeker came into the house and died into the in the house, and that and that is a legend that kind of goes along with the the lore of the house. And her spirit was reputed to haunt the house. And I never, you know, I would go downstairs and kind of look for the spirit because I'm I'm um, I am biracial and I'm also interracially married. So the, the, and the point of saying that is that I think I was the only black woman. I had an idea that I was, well, I was the only black adult in the family, you know, not counting my children who were babies and, and weren't even born when we started going there. But I imagined that this ghost had not seen another black person since, you know, since she became a spirit. And the reason I had that in my mind is that, um, the other escaped, you know, formerly, you know, I use the word very clearly, formerly enslaved African Americans were hidden not in the house, but in the root cellar and were not brought into the house unless there was something wrong. And I wondered about her, you know, was she, I, I fantasized that she was an old woman who couldn't make it the rest of the way to Canada because she was too weak. But then I thought, well, what would be another reason to bring her into the house? Maybe she was pregnant, maybe she was in labor. And then I came up with the idea of a very young girl who was impregnated by her enslaver and you know, raped by her enslaver and, and escaped with friends. And um, so I started with her story. And then I imagined my relationship to the house. Yeah. 
So her relationship, the, the relationship of the actual ghost, then I imagined, imagined my relationship as someone on vacation, going to relax, you know, cooking fun stuff on the patio and, and drinking wine and, and making fun brunches and reading books rolled up in, in the, the window seat while it's raining outside and um, partaking of everything. There was no place I couldn't go. And what would the ghost think of that? And I imagined what, what if they met or didn't meet, but what if their realities kind of fused for a moment and they could each see the other's reality through their own eyes. So that got me really interested. And so I started with the story of the birthing room was the original. And I actually published that in the Piltdown Review. That was the very first piece. And then I said, well, what if this becomes a novel? And, um, but by then, but I was kind of done with Galen and, and Clementine. Right. And then I couldn't help but wonder about Maxine, who is this white Airbnb proprietress. And initially I was thinking she didn't know Galen was black and was kind of surprised to see her. And then I thought, well, what if she did know? And what if that was why? What if for some reason this white Airbnb proprietress had a reason to want a black person to meet the ghost in the house? And what was it about Max? Then I got curious about Maxine and what was her, how did she get to the house? She wasn't, she married into the family that owned the house. She yeah. was kind of a, an, you know, a, a Bohemian Jewish um, painter, um, grew up in New York City. And, and then I wondered when she takes this life drawing class where Maxine is compelled to learn more about black people and she wants to paint black people. So she goes to this life drawing class and she scopes out to see when the, the one black life drawing model shows up and her name is Michelle Leeds. And then I found myself wondering, well, why is, this young 26 year old woman, black woman up in the Berkshires, because it's not really a very, you know, black vacation spot. Right. What is she doing there? And I discovered that Michelle herself had her own story about the Berkshires, not necessarily Whitaker House, but to heal the trauma, her, uh, she's a very spiritual kind of therapist, a different sort of therapist than what the work I do, but she is sent to the site of her trauma to reclaim the narrative to reclaim her body and to reclaim her own truth. Um, so that's what she's doing there. And then she meets Dominique, who is Canadian and has her own story. So I can't, it just became this sort of tapestry of different women, mostly who were drawn to the Berkshires somehow. And, and not just women, girls, Pam in 1983 is a very young girl growing up in, in a housing project in Boston. And she goes, she's invited to Whitaker House on a leadership trip, which is really kind of a ruse because you find out later that, that this whole cohort of, you know, the, of inner city, the, you know, the world, the word kind of heavily thrown around again, of inner city teenagers invited up to Whitaker House also sort of to meet the ghosts. And it's, it's kind of, um, and Pam has a very important experience in the house, and I'm not going to give that away. But she's kind of a young, she's a young, um, very you know, low-income girl who has just lost her mom. She is um, it, just in love with fancy things and Laura Ashley and House Beautiful magazine because her mother used to used to work in a hair salon and they had these magazines. And Pam just imagined you know, Whitaker house that she was invited to and it was gonna have mirrored walls and, and chintz um, sofas and, and Laura Ashley, everything. And, and, and it has some of that. And so it's very special to her, but then she meets all the spirits right. and, and has her own, you know, experience. So, yeah, so I, every, it got woven together. And I have to say like, when people ask me where I got that idea of, of lifting a character from each story and making a new story out of it. I was super inspired by, uh, by Elizabeth Strout and, and Olive Kitteridge, but, but even more so anything is possible that, that you're kind of reading and you're like, oh, that's the husband from that other story. And there was something really special to me in reading that and, and, and it, that, that um, model that kind of inspired me. Um, 
So, you know, kind of giving credit. And she's also one of my absolute favorite authors, um, even though I have not read her most recent. Yeah. Okay. Well, so wonderful insights. And I, I, I really appreciate you talking about tapestry because I think that, I think that nails, uh, you know, the way these characters exist on the page and through history um, and, and the way they connect to each other. You, you touched on a little bit. One of the questions I had was, you know, the issue of race obviously mm -hmm. is a primary theme. Um, the ways whites view blacks and themselves as they relate to blacks and is dealt with with sensitivity and extreme nuance. And, and clearly just from what you've said tonight, this is, this is informed at least partially by your own experience and your own kind of understanding um, it's clearly very important to you to kind of interrogate and unpack some of these identity related uh, concerns. Definitely. I'm trying to think of where's the question. I'm not sure what the question is, but yeah. Well, so, you know, talk, talk a little yeah. bit about why it was important for you, um, you know, to, to specifically, so, it, you know, I understand, I think anyone can understand, you know, there's got to be some white, or there doesn't have to be, but it, it works to have some white characters interacting and mm -hmm. providing some social commentary, but but you you really went a little deeper in my opinion, and again, in a very effective way in terms of, of really looking at how white people see themselves seeing black people black or people. being seen by, and, and so there's humor there, but it's mm -hmm. also, it's extremely effective um, and, and I think very subtle social commentary. So I did that a lot with Maxine because, um, Maxine sort of is very innocent in terms of that. Now she's been raised by very, very liberal um, Jewish parents. And, and, and there's really a distinction between her, her family came to this country, you know, her family came to this country in the 20th century. They escaped Europe, they, they fled and, and found themselves here. So white privilege has a different kind of taste and feel and and um it, there's a little bit of confusion so her when she's a little girl and this is just a quick flashback it's not even in the story it's mentioned you know it's mentioned that she had a black babysitter and um maxine as a little girl wanted a black baby doll and her and her parents were who were kind of extreme liberals liberal intellectuals were horrified at the notion of a white child owning a black doll to manipulate as she saw fit that that no she should never have that but the black babysitter was sort of touched by the idea that Maxine wanted a black baby doll so the and the babysitter said well I'll buy it for her and then the babysitter got fired because it was just such an uncomfortable thing because they couldn't even look at her this her parents couldn't even look at her that that her their child had done something that might have potentially had a racist flavor, so they, they it was all confused. So Maxine, as a child, didn't get to grapple with what race meant, right? You know, and and so now she's in this home haunted by black people, and she falls in love with them. Mm -hmm. And because of what what happens first, the first ghost she meets is Birdie, and she hears a newborn baby squalling in her home. So she's running around the house trying to soothe the baby. Where are you? Where are you? I'm here. Can I help you? What can I do? And she's also had a very traumatic um, loss of a pregnancy. So there's that connection between, you know, her her loss of pregnancy and then her husband, who is older, has has um, passed away. And here she is, childless, and here's the baby. And so she wants to you know, I don't know, she kind of wants to internalize blackness and all of her efforts are just kind of, you know, she stumbles and then says the wrong thing or interprets the wrong thing. And when Galen and Rob come to the house and um, and she's trying to communicate with Galen and trying to show, and Galen is black, Rob is white for people who didn't read it. She's trying to show Galen how respectful she is. And she's trying to use the right words and say freedom seekers instead of runaway slaves. And she's trying to, and she puts her foot in her mouth and um, she thinks Galen can't stand her. Really Galen's got postpartum depression and is just has this um, also is already being sort of affected 
by Clementine and the spirits in the house. Um, yeah. But um, so, and the other, another piece of it is I wanted very much to show the, the privilege of Catherine, who is a white mother with two white, you know, and, and non, non-Jewish white, um, you know, Mayflower kind of stock family mm-hmm. from um, from Connecticut, and she has two, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed sons, and she has adopted Timothy, who is black, and he's also autistic, and he's the youngest. And Catherine's um, also had a, a traumatic birth loss, a, you know, pregnancy loss, and also a traumatic adoption um, disruption. And Timothy is the only boy who didn't come from her tummy, as he says, but he is sort of her soulmate. And even her husband can't, you know, she, so she parents him, you know, I always say, because my, my mother who's deceased now was, was white Jewish, but not, you know, but she parented with her elbows, like on the lookout for racism, you know, who's gonna, who's gonna do something mean to my baby. But Catherine also has the privilege of being the white parent, whereas Galen is a black mother with a biracial daughter, Olivia, who is so pale that they don't look alike. And and she parents with the notion that someone might take Olivia because she doesn't look like Galen. And Timothy doesn't look anything like Catherine, but that would never happen. Um, So there's there's a lot, there's also a lot about motherhood and a lot about, there's a lot about motherhood and a lot about class and kind of the, the race class nuance was really important to me um, because it fascinates me now that you know we, we especially now that we're talking so much about um, white privilege and about class and about the erasure of history. And how is it possible that there are women, you know, Kay is another one, she's, a, you know, an MBA, she owns her own brownstone. She's married to Andy, who is white and Jewish. And um, she has every privilege you can imagine. But when she falls and twists her ankle and lands in the gutter and she smudges her Michael Kors coat and the realtor who sold Kay her, you know, million dollar brownstone steps over her while showing another couple around around the neighborhood and says to the couple, we rarely see that sort of thing around here. Yeah. Not recognized. So Kay, one trip and one smudge of mud lost all her class privilege, all her you know, affluence, all of her everything, and became something the, the same as if she had been on a plantation in 1850. She she lost her personhood. And so it's that tenuous, no matter what your education is or or income or um, size of your brownstone, that that there is this, um, you know, I, I just finished reading um, Isabel Wilkerson's Cast, which is such an such an incredible book because it speaks about race in in a very kind of a very unique way. You know that that it's this is your place, and there's really nothing that you can do to change it, even if you have income and education and access. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to, I wanted to play with those themes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I wanted to play with those themes and, and the fact that Kay and Catherine have so much in common because they're both upper middle-class parents and both of their children have access to, you know, Taekwondo and art classes and science camp and tennis camp. And, you know, there, it's about, and, and the, the little things we do as kind of middle-class moms to kind of temper the world, you know, C- Catherine carries Timothy in the rain because he can't tolerate the worms that ha- have come overnight. And I actually was the kid that was terrified of worms that came out overnight when it, when it rained. And I remember running, screaming over them, but, but, you know, also Kay has to make sure that you know she gets chocolate croissants and and um, make sure everybody's got their iPads and and they you know and the special olives. So it's they they both they're the same. You know they could probably have a long conversation about mothering 
and yet their experiences are different. And um, Kate yearns to be in a community where she's not the only black friend of a slew of white women of white women. And you so said there's a yeah. So yeah, and, and I think you know it resonates on so many levels because these are important contemporary conversations that we need to have. And I think uh, one of the the things that this this novel does remarkably well is it doesn't have the so-called straw men of easy, you know, that guy's racist or that woman is prejudiced. It's talking about this, this, these nuances and of this gray area of um, and the through line, you know, from the way uh, female slaves were treated, you know, and raped to the, 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 the encounter that you mentioned in the street um, with the realtor. You know, I think that these are these are conversations as we work through our political kind of socio political present. Clearly, these issues aren't going away. Uh, I think a novel like yours, you know, in addition to being very entertaining, which is its own achievement, um, is forcing us to look at some of these things in a very um, nuanced way, which which is all all to the good. So. That leads me to, you know, one of the, you know, there's so many writer cliche questions that are still worth, in, you know, talking about, but, you know, you hear the, 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 the one extreme of write what you know, and then you have the writers that say, write what you don't know. It seems very clear that this is a book where is drawing uh, profoundly from your own expertise and passion, but is also just from what you've described and having read it, I can attest tremendous work of imagination. Um, you know, how much did one influence the other? You know, did you get into, you know, a sense of, you know, you were able, like talk to, you know, a lot of people that watch this series are either aspiring or young writers. They're like, how do you do this? Talk a little bit about, you know, drawing your own personal experience and expertise in the service of an imaginative work. Okay. So I will say very clearly to people who are, are writers just starting out, how did you do this? This is probably, if I'm going to be like really honest, this is probably the fifth novel I've written, and and this is the only one. And, and we're we're counting the one I wrote in high school and the one I wrote after. Like if it were probably six, if we're counting the one that that you know. But um, you know, I I was thinking a little bit smaller for this one because I was thinking I was I had this unifying. Um, this unifying element of the house yeah. and and my relationship to the house versus the relationship of an enslaved woman who was in who had no access and that that just kind of exploded and ideas kept coming and there are a lot of ideas that didn't make it in for example I was going to have a whole story about Annie's um, youngest son Silas and and mm -hmm. I decided not to because that that would have been its own thing, and I, I had an, a a I didn't need I didn't need as much running away and making it north as as that would have given me. Right. But um, I I wanted to I wanted to talk about the legacy, and and the word the the guiding word for this book for me is almost. You know that, and I and I use that in the book, like the the um, the first group of escape of escaped um, formerly enslaved people make it to the root cellar, and then there's a fire in the root cellar, and one we find has gotten away, but the rest of them, they made it and they got to freedom almost. You know, they made it to Massachusetts. You know, they've been in Georgia and North Carolina, and they made it as far as Massachusetts, and then their dreams were snuffed out by fire. And their spirits haunt forever. So they're kind of almost, and their hopes get pinned onto Pam in the 1980s. They get pinned onto uh, onto uh, Pam and onto Kay and and Galen. Their hopes kind of hang in the air around this house. Yes, it's this almost. And so when you look at a successful, you know, a, a reasonably successful black woman who's a mother, who's parenting children, that she has no fear of somebody taking them and, and selling them. And yet, um, am I, do I have everything that little Annie and Clementine wanted? 
you know, what was their dream and what would they think of what I had? And I kind of couldn't get that out of my out of my head. And do I have it? Do I have everything I want in life? Yes. And do I have the equality and freedom that they longed for? And I'd have to say almost, yeah. you know, I'd have to say almost, because I do have to, you know, like Kay, you know, when she went out of the house with her babies, her, her babies always look neat and their, their onesies are clean and their hair is combed. And whereas the white women, and she's always put together and whereas the white mothers can go out in sloppy ponytails and sweats and there can be spit up on their shirt. And that's sort of a badge of, of like, I care more about my baby than how I look, but yeah. she can't, you know, she's, that's the almost, but so that's, that's where the writing, what I know, but what I would say is, you know, write and what you know is kind of going to drive your work. Sure. What you know is going to drive what you're doing. And, and as you venture into territory that you don't know, well, that's what research is for. And, and I think, I think anyone can do research. Like it, it's, um, you know, I think there's a lot of debate right now whether a white person can write a black main character and is it that and and that becomes complicated because it because I, I don't think anybody can write a monochromatic book right now but I also do think it's important to think about is this my story to tell and you know for example you know I, I wrote a YA book and there were two main characters and it, it was a ballet YA book which I may rewrite at some point and there they were twins and the, the girl twin was, um, you know, the girl twin had a lot of the same experiences that I did. And, and the boy twin had a lot of experiences that a lot of my friends did, but he was, he, he was gay. And I was aware, very much aware that I'm writing a gay male adolescent. And is that okay for me to be doing it? And I had gay male adolescents as beta readers. So you know, and, and gave me pointers and gave me affirmations and gave me, you know, advice. Um, but I think that was really important, you know, because his story wasn't my story to tell. The twin story was more, you know, the girl story to tell, the, the, yeah. you know, but, but, uh, but ballet is what I know and, and what life is like. And it was about, um, it was about being in a second company you know, and how you're kind of like, you're better than the kids in the school, but you're kind of the lowest of the low when it comes to the, the actual dancers in the main company. And, and, um, and that is something I know. So I, I do, and I think two of the, two of the three novels I've written have been ballet centric, mm. ballet centric. Yeah. But, um, and there, we'll see what happens to them if they come back. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I would say, write what you know, and, and, because that will get you that will get you writing. That's right. And then what you don't know, because if you only write what you know, you're gonna get pretty bored. And um, but also let yourself be inspired by stories in the news, by you know, this, you know, this dog walked into a police station in London and curled up in a little ball because he somehow knew that somebody was gonna come for him and they did, and that was like the cutest story, and like somebody should write a middle grade about that dog and and who it, so, so it's like anything can happen that that inspires you yeah yeah so, yeah thank you for that, that, that I, question or that was like, no oh. word, words of wisdom um you know that comes up also a lot in the series and in a lot of our programming you know this notion i think it's a it, it's always been there but i think it's a very pertinent to the contemporary kind of literary discourse like who has the right to tell a story and i don't have firm opinions uh, especially since i'm a, a white straight male i mean i'm, I'm very aware um, even artistically or especially artistically of, of my privilege and also places that even if I could compellingly tell, you know, from a woman's perspective, like there's a lot of women that probably could tell it better and, and their stories are, are, are probably closer to the truth. But I think what you really underscored with your answer that I appreciate is I, I think the, you know, the, the two minute answer for any aspiring writer um, seems to be you can write about whatever you want, but just be aware that if you're not writing it from a place of, of you know, honesty and, and some kind mm -hmm. of informed perspective, it's not going to resonate and it's not going to connect. 
So why bother? So yeah, I, 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 I for me, I don't think there's a, a hard and fast, like, no, you cannot write about a gay person or a black person, but it's like, what is your motivation to do that? And that, I think that will be a self-answering question in some regards. And I, and I, I do think, I do think that's complicated and I do think that's important um, because I, I, I also that know that there's a lot of racism in publishing in that, um, you know, it, it seems like, wow, everybody is black, you know, every, all of a sudden we're elevating black authors. But if you look at how many black authors have written books and how many white authors have written books and Asian and, and uh, Latina books, that, that the number of books that become, you know, hot that are talked about, it, it's, there may be one or two that are of color, but it, it just, it still is not that many. Right. You know, it's, it's more than it used to be. So it feels like a lot. Um, but I think there are so many, there are so many of us, there are so many authors. Um, and so I think it is important to notice, am I silencing someone if I tell this other person's story? Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, I'm thinking about like what, right now, one of the books I'm working on, I, it, it's, it's about biracial identity and sort of a, a separated at birth kind of thing. Um, and, and the by and I made the male, I made the, pro, the protagonist male and I'm, I'm not sure why or whether or not they're going to stay male. It feels like it. But I think when you look at who has privilege and if it's a white person and you're black, or if it's a, a male and you're female, so those who are in the, in the more marginalized position, for example, as a woman, yeah. I've had to speak man all my life because I've had to fit in the world. And just like, I've had to notice whiteness all my, and now I'm, I am biracial. So I've walked under the umbrella of my mother's whiteness as a child, you know, going, going where she went as her child. So that's another, you know, I've written a, a little bit about that and what it means to have sort of the white umbrella, even though as soon as she let go of my hand, I'm a little black girl and, and, and any, any privilege I got from her, that's, that's out the window. But I learned, I've learned whiteness growing up in this country. So it's not hard, you know, and Kat wasn't a hard character for me to write. Uh, Kat, she's Catherine, I'm sorry. A lot of, I will say to anybody who's interested, so many of my characters changed names so many times in this book. And sometimes I have to remember what they're now named. <laughs> the actual, the last provision, which I think is the proofread, the, the, the professional proofread that happens right before, you know, before the, the arc, after the arc, which is the um, administrator copy, and this is the final version, um, I changed, I changed one name. I changed a Stephanie to a Victoria. And that was like how I knew that the edits went through. But so Catherine, <laughs> Catherine was, Catherine was easy for me to write because I'm friends with a lot of women who are similar to Catherine, who may have adopted a black child. And, and rather than, you know, I know we hear all the time about white women who have adopted black children and have no idea how to do their hair or, or raise them out of the black community. Um, she's very much trying to be as woke as she possibly can. Now he's a boy. So there isn't a question of what do I do with her hair? Right. But there still is, you know, it, it, I mean, um, but I, I had to learn white mom language, you know, so I, it's very easy for me. It was easy for me to do her. Also, I had a white mom, but, um, but it's interesting when you look at telling a story that's not your own. Other more other works, other things that I'm working on do have biracial black Jewish protagonist women, mm -hmm. which is my default. Sure. Um, you know, and but it, but I think it's I think when you are multiracial, there are more perspectives that you've had to kind of internalize if that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. And again, yeah. I, I think it's, it's so, it's brought to bear consistently throughout the narrative here. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons this book is so rich, it's very dense, but there are, there are a multitude of perspectives that are told with authority. Uh, and I think that's also a difference between 
you know, not needing permission. And I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about any writer writing about whatever you want, but is it going to be compelling? Is it going to be convincing? This, this book certainly does that. And I, I think you've really articulated wonderfully how there is a, a needle to thread the difference between imagination and authority and instinct, uh, you know, but I, 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 I think it's, I think we've, I think we've safely concluded that, um, you know, there's no wrong answer, but there are a lot of wrong ways to, to approach. And I think that also brings up something that I wanted to ask you about. And, and you mentioned that this is not your first novel. Um, everyone always wants to hear about the story. Um, how did this book go from first draft to publication? You know, what was the, how long roughly was your, was the process? The first story that I wrote, I told you was the birthing room and I can look right now. The, the first thing is 2018 and it was 2018 when I was writing that chapter. Okay. So, so it was 2018 and I was, my son was involved in a, a soccer program that was four nights a week for two hours and a pop. And I did a lot of carpooling and sitting in my van with my laptop writing um, with no internet access, which was great because I, I wasn't distracted. And right. um, when I when I published the birthing room story, I sent it to my agent and I said, hey, what if this is an, if this becomes a novel? And my agent is very, very supportive and enthusiastic. And he's, and, and also sometimes very laconic. Like he responded right away, like, Few minutes later, and he's really quick with emails, which is I hear not always the thing, not always the case with an agent. Yeah. Um, so he was like, "Great, <laughs> looking forward to it." So or or something like that. So yeah. I I said, "So how do I do it?" And I kept on thinking, you know, maybe it'll be a Berkshire, you know, just a, a little Berkshire safe house book, and and I'll just write this story, and then that'll be big enough, and then I'll write that, and then it just kept on going and. Really, I would say 70% of this book was written in my minivan waiting for soccer practice to end. Or like there was a little birthday party room in the soccer arena. And like, I would sometimes go in there if it was cold and there were there were like flies and pieces of cake <laughs> discarded. <laughs> was, there was no left one. But um, so, so I, and I finished it. He had thoughts about how to tie the stories closer together. I did the best I could with that. And then, um, Shopped it around, shopped it around. Everybody was like, you know, this is really beautiful, but it's not quite, uh, you know, not quite right for our list. You know, the, the, the favorite thing people say. Also, you know, it wasn't, um, I think the fact that there were so many vignettes, yes. you know, that it is, it, it forms a novel, but also at that stage of the game, it wasn't the book it is now. So I think the stories were linked, but they weren't. And um, Selena James of Little A, uh, I, we sent her, you know, Uva, my Uva Skander, my agent, and I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, he he reached out to Selena because we we were kind of researching, uh, you know, more more editors, and we were specifically looking at Black women editors, mm -hmm. um, we, we or or people who were very supportive of African American stories. Sure. And um, Selena got back to him almost immediately and said, um, you know, can Lisa send this? I had to send her a CV. Can she send us that? Can she send a uh, synopsis of other stuff? Can she send us a, some, like all this other stuff that I had to like quickly cobble together because I'm terrible at writing synopses because they have to be concise and yeah. <laughs> yeah, not. <laughs> I edit a lot. Um, and she, by the, I think, I don't remember the timing exactly, but after a week she said, would Lisa be up for a phone call? And like, when you hear that somebody wants to have a phone call with you, then you're like, oh my God, this is it. And sure enough, we had a call and it was uh, my agent and, and Selena and myself. And then the following week, um, we heard that she was giving it to uh, the acquisition team. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a nail biter. And, and just to everyone out there, no one, authors don't talk about being on submission. Like you don't talk about being on submission. That's when you've queried, you've gotten an agent, your agent is submitting your book and there's nothing you can do about that book except for keep yourself entertained by writing another book. That's but, um, but you don't talk about submission because when you're on submission, you're just, there's nothing you can do. And, um, and what if your agent can sell the book? But acquisition team loved it. And um, 
Then Selena came back to me and said, okay, before you do your developmental edit, here's what I need you to do. So I made a whole bunch of changes. Mm -hmm. um, most of it was tying the stories even closer together. Okay. And then I was assigned, um, I really wish somebody else in the house would go get my dog because um, he's barking. I can't hear. <laughs> you can't, okay. So um, then I was assigned a developmental editor. And this is the process when, you know, when, when yeah. you're traditionally published, there are a lot of editors and, and the developmental editor was a woman named Michelle Fly also a black woman who somehow, it, it felt like she had been born from my brain because all the things I wanted this book to do, she somehow got, and she was so respectful too. She was like, you know, what do you think about maybe Josiah having a bigger role? And I was like, I was thinking Josiah should have a bigger role. And, and what do you think about, you know, about Pop, can we develop his character? I was like, yes, we can develop Pop because I wanted Pop to have more. You know, so there were there was obviously there was there was less for the men to do even before. So so she had me give the men, particularly the black men, in the story a little more. But after we did two edits, then these other people from members of the team send me emails with copies of my book and and. Um, you know, there's a pink, there are pink edits and blue edits and green edits and, and all the things and, and um, or, or it just came out that way on my computer and everybody seemed to really get it. And that's why I feel like I really opened this book and every place I open the book, I'm really happy with what's there. And I know that, that you know, often writers talk about, oh, I can't read anything I wrote in the past because I always want to change things. Like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with the the editorial experience was wonderful right and then yeah and then they gave me the date that it was coming out and, and that's it yeah well a yeah. and d I, I think that lisa that that's also really important for people to hear um you know the it, it never can be said enough it's very mm -hmm. unlikely for any young uh, or aspiring writer your first time out, it's going to, you know, connect and it's going to be painless. I think what you're, what you're, what, what you're demonstrating is that there, even with acceptance, there has to be humility because there, that's why editors exist. Um, projects can and probably should always be refined, but it is, it, it's a, it's a long haul. Um, and it's this combination of patience and faith, uh, and perseverance. And, uh, your story is very inspiring because it clearly, did not come easily or quickly for you, but I wonder if, uh, for like so many other writers, the the material is better for that. Not to say that anyone can or should. I'm not a fan of making somebody wait a long time, but if someone's oh. learning the right lessons along the way, uh, mm -hmm. invariably they're going to pick up tricks and 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 figure out ways to make their writing better. And I will say that I, that the first novel I queried. Um, I don't remember exactly when it was, but the first novel I queried did not get me an agent. The second novel I queried did get me my agent. My agent didn't sell that book. Mm -hmm. He sold the third novel. And in between there, there was a nonfiction, um, there was a nonfiction book proposal somewhere in there too mm -hmm. that, that my agent um, didn't sell. And actually I'm really glad because I didn't want to write that book. After, by the time I'd finished the nonfiction book proposal, I was kind of like, oh, I don't want to write this one. And I, and when he said to me, you know, we got, he calls them size when, when, when we get a rejection from a publisher, he's like, sigh from Simon and Schuster or sigh from, and, and my response to him was like, can I just write another novel and we'll see what happens with that. I wasn't that disappointed, but you know, you keep, you keep trying. And, and yeah. Well, and also, right, I think it's also important to, to, to reiterate that uh, I think in America, especially, right, we, we want quick and easy. And, you know, I'm so, heartened, <laughs> okay. I, I'm so heartened by your story, Lisa, though, because, of course, I've heard, uh, I'm sure we've all heard so many nightmare stories of the wrong editors or the wrong house or a bad fit, uh, bad agent relationship. And your story proves it doesn't happen all the time, but boy, is it wonderful and refreshing 
when you find the right editor or the right team, they get it, they work with you, they want it to succeed. I just think that in addition to that being a happy ending that's well deserved, I think that also is a reminder that you can't force it. And when it's meant to be, it's like a relationship. It, it, things will click. Um, and I think that's, that's the feeling that a lot of writers should hold out for you. A writer deserves that kind of treatment in my opinion. Yeah. So, so listen, we are, as usual, whenever I have a great writer on the time flies by. So I have two things to say. One, let's talk again sometime. You know, once you, once That's one true. comes into the 1455 fold, I have a hard time letting them go. So there's more to discuss, but as a, as a parting shot, so everyone wants to know, I want to know, is there a project you're working on now that we may see? What is next for Elisa or what is in the short term future? Oh, I have three, including the first one that I actually queried. There, there, I've got a few different um, WIPs, works in progress going. And I am just today, I kind of decided maybe I'm going to do a different one <laughs> of the three. So, so definitely stuff is coming up next. I don't know exactly which but you will be, there will, there will, there is more. Well, and what, a, and listen, right. What a blessing. Um, you know, I, I think yeah. any of us that are, that are creative, uh, mm -hmm. I think the biggest fear, or I'll speak for myself, but I, I've heard this from a lot of people. Um, you know, the, the bigger fear than rejection is the well running dry. So when there's more in the pipeline, that's such a, that in itself is such a blessing and a gift. Um, so I'm really happy to hear that you're keeping busy and got a lot on your plate. Absolutely. Well, thank you. It has been such a pleasure talking to you, Sean, and I look forward to doing that again, maybe in person at some point, you know, now that, yeah. For sure, for sure. So let's let's keep after, maybe when the, uh, when the movie comes out, we will do a, because uh, I definitely, maybe that'll be fodder for our next discussion. I had a running list of people I saw playing some of these characters. So oh, let's- Oh, wow, let's, really? Let's, of course. So, yeah. so let's hope that that is coming down the pike because it deserves to be uh, a movie. But let's, but let's focus on the book, Embers on the Wind. Lisa, it was a tremendous uh, pleasure to read this. It's an honor to talk to you about it. Congratulations uh, on your success. And, you know, the story doesn't end here. Let's hope that this continues to reach a really wide audience. And we want to hear and see more from you. Uh, folks, again, Embers on the Wind, go to pottershouse.org and buy your book, support independent booksellers. It's the holiday season, so pick up a few copies for friends. Uh, Lisa, all the best, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, take care. Very nice to talk with you. All right, be well, and everyone out there, be safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.